my second question back to you all is really, is there scope for alternative financing of various different kinds to make that money have a greater impact, to help mainstream financing be more effective, promote innovation, promote accountability? Any thoughts on that? Or are we basically just saying, no, it has to be government financing and there isn't really space or value added from alternative sources? Your, your thoughts on that? Yeah. I think, of course, there is, I mean, a value added in terms of, you know, I mean, uh, the alternative financing dimension, especially coming from, you know, the uh, private sector side. We know that the private sector are very good in innovation. Private sector are very good, I mean, good, I mean, uh, governance structures. So obviously, bringing in private sector money into the whole education system also has its own added benefit in terms of really, not only in the financing dimension, but also in terms of improving processes and systems within the education system as well. I mean, the bank, I mean, uh, we've got, as I said, we're trying to, we've done it in other sectors, not much in education, but obviously the use of, I mean, uh, uh, private equity funds is one catalytic way of drawing the private sector, I mean, into financing, I mean, uh, some interventions in Africa. As you know, obviously, there is always this, I mean, uh, uh, concern by some investors in terms of investing in Africa. But the bank, we've effectively used our AAA rating, as I said earlier, in terms of trying to provide comfort to some of these investors in investing. And I can see no reason why it will not work in, I mean, education in that particular context. Does yet. No, we've not yet done any private equity in education per se. Very good. But it's a model that can be applied across all sectors. Okay. Iqbal, yeah. what, what do you think? I mean, is this something that the Aga Khan Development Network explicitly wants to do with your finance? Are you trying to leverage change and improvement in mainstream financing, or is that not really something you're trying to achieve? No, absolutely. It's, it's a mix of things, and I think one of the, the areas we need to prevent ourselves from doing is painting things in black and white terms, because... Um, the realities of how education is provided, funded, supported, and so on, is much more subtle than that. Uh, there's a combination of things where you have just government schools run by government, sponsored by them, and funded by them. And they range from that all the way to a mix of uh, public-private partnerships, where the government provides the school facilities, but the local community runs the school, picks the teacher, teacher training is done by somebody else, um, so there's a whole range of things, and, and I think they, in, in some cases they're country or even context specific. But we have had experience with all of those. What I do observe from that public-private partnership thing is that there is mutual accountability. It makes the government more accountable and more effective in, in the use of its resources, and it also holds the private sector more accountable. Um, so I think wherever you have that kind of a partnership, it seems to be a better approach. Again, I'm not recommending that as the only approach, but that seems to be a better approach. And, and Ron, from your own experience, I mean, is, do you think looking to the future, will we see greater diversification of financing for education in China, or are we going to see continuing it being the tax base community or, or central government funded? Well, actually, I can see in the future, definitely there will be more kind of um, government appropriations channeled into the education sector. As I mentioned earlier, China has experienced two stages of uh, reform. The first stage can be characterized as decentralization and diversification. And starting in the year 2005, around that, and we entered another stage, the second stage, which I would call it the, the, well, the re-centralization and the de diversification. And as, actually, as a consequence of a diversification in the first stage, there have been some negative consequences. For, for instance, you know, that imposed a serious heavy burden upon rural farmers, and also the regional disparity and urban versus rural duality, that kind of equity and equality problems were exacerbated. And so in the second stage, we can see you know, like governments made much more effort to enforce commitments of government at various levels, you know, to prioritize education spending, especially for compulsory education. And also the central government uh, started to take more responsibility for financing uh, recurrent expenditures of our compulsory uh, education schools. And, but going back to, to the point you want to make, actually I think we shouldn't deny that diversification, that kind of education finance regime 
played a very important role. And during those years,、uh, the schools relied heavily upon local communities, and really communities were very enthusiastic and had, you know, much stronger ownership over schools. And we can see, you know, the recent reform in some cases kind of has some negative impact in that aspect. Yeah. Thank you, and thanks to our panelists.、Um,